loves welcome back today we're going to be doing my january and february book video i hate january and february so much um i just hate the winter post christmas it just loses all of its shine for me and i'm just over the gray days but usually it's a very good time of year for me with my reading um, and this year it's been no different i've got lots of good books to share with you and i'm really really excited so this is our pile i don't actually know if it's all the books it's definitely not absolutely all of them um, but this is what I was working with when I was writing my review. So um, I might go back to making these monthly videos now that I'm reading a little bit more again, but we'll see. It's quite a time consuming job. It basically takes the whole week to make one of these videos, get the written reviews ready and all of that kind of stuff. So we shall see. Um, but when I looked at the long list of books from the last two months, I was like, hmm, maybe I should be doing these more often. I can't do it as I go, by the way. Before someone suggests that, I just cannot write reviews as I go. I have to do it all in one go. I think because it takes me a little while to actually just get in the zone to write the reviews. Um, but anyway, this last couple of months was marked particularly by a couple of good fantasy finds, which I was so excited about because I feel like I don't find fantasy that suits me very much these days. It's also just exactly what you want in life when it's grey and dull and gross outside. It's just to escape into another world. So I'm very much looking forward to sharing those with you. Before we do, let's do the book club um, books. Um, so for March and April, we are reading these two books. So we've got Stay With Me this month by Ayobami Adebayo and when We Were Orphans by Kazuo Ishiguro um, for April. Um, I've read this one before. I haven't read Stay With Me. I know she's got a new book out and it's been very well received. This one was beloved as well. But I have read When We Were Orphans a very long time ago. I want to say like 10 years ago. I remember finding this book just beguiling is the word I would use. Um, I thought I knew where it was going and then it kind of switched up on me. And I remember finding it kind of fascinating um, what Ishiguro was doing there. So I'm looking forward to reading this one with book club. I'm looking forward to reading both of book club. Um, so those are the picks for the next couple of months. The January's book club pick was O Caledonia by Elspeth Barker. This is the only novel she ever wrote. Um, a Scottish author. It opens with 16 year old Janet. She's lying murdered underneath a stained glass window in this Kind of gothic setting of a Scottish castle, her family home. So we start with this image and then we go backwards to the beginning of it all and we work through her life. So it's billed as a gothic tale, this one, and it is gothic uh, in some elements of it, but more than anything, it's kind of an unusual coming of age kind of girlhood uh, book set in Scotland obviously and Scotland has a big role to play in this um, particularly the nature writing in it is gorgeous just captures something of Scotland's kind of romantic mysticism and the reason it takes on such a big role in this book is because Janet finds it really difficult to um, connect with and fit in with other people including her own family and this one kind of split the crowd on book club for a few of us it kind of felt like something was missing I think because I read it so closely as I tend to do um, so I can prepare for our meetings I had a sort of greater appreciation for it but yeah it's not a particularly meaty novel I wouldn't say but as I say there's some really beautiful nature writing in here there's some really beautiful stuff about coming of age as a person that doesn't feel like they fit in and more than anything I took away from from it um, because of Janet's parents attitude towards her the way they treat her and how they kind of malign her for being different not fitting into the perfect category of good girl certainly not on her way to a kind of super feminine version of womanhood it really just reminded me how often I mean this is set I, I want to say in the kind of 50s 60s I may be wrong I can't quite remember it was written in the 90s to me it sort of brought to mind um, how often we fail our children, particularly girls, how we failed them, and in some ways how we continue to fail them. So yeah, that was my big takeaway from this book. Um, the ending is a little abrupt, some might say. But yes, if it kind of sounds like your cup of tea, if you like that sort of more reflective coming of age novel, you might really enjoy this one. Um, 
The, our other book club pick for February was Pew, which I have read before. Pew by Catherine Lacey. She also has a book out and I look forward to reading it. I have got an arc of it, so I, I'm excited to read that one. But I have to say, knowing sort of what I know about Pew and about Lacey, I feel like this book has got to be her masterpiece. And reading it a second time round, I loved it even more. It's now, I think, easily one of my all-time favourite books. It's just the perfect novel for my tastes really. I loved picking it apart a little bit more, I loved discussing it with book club, um, it was just an all-round fabulous experience for me. Um, I read this one last when I was heavily pregnant and in sort of a dream world basically, so although I knew I really liked it and that there was a lot going on in here, I didn't have my full analytical capacities <laughs> working. So this time round as I say, I really, really enjoyed it. And there are just so many ways you could interpret this novel. So it's about Pew. They are a person with no discernible race, age or gender. Sorry, my loves, I've just had to move you ever so slightly so I could get a bit of back support. And they find themselves in this small town in the American South and they're obviously met by the inhabitants of this town with a selection of reactions um, from kind of fear and disgust and confusion or you know misplaced charitable feeling or acceptance and there are a few characters like that in here too. I mean there's just there's so much to say about this I am unsure where to sort of begin. It reads a little bit like a parable, it is narrated by Pew who isn't going to give you any answers, it is vague. Pew is very enigmatic, I'm not sure Pew even knows where they're from or what they're doing there. Faith and religion is a huge theme here so um, this time around it really struck me how personal this novel felt. So Catherine Lacey is from Mississippi herself. She has moved out of the South, she doesn't live there anymore, and her depiction of the South felt very accurate, and also it felt like she was really kind of reflecting and coming to terms with some of the hypocrisies maybe that she noticed in her um, upbringing. It just felt a lot more personal to me this time round and more specific because the first time round I really felt what Lacey was trying to say in that um, you know these people really try and categorize Pew, they really try and put Pew in a box, label Pew and it doesn't really resonate with Pew and it did make me think the first time round obviously about um, our sort of innate human need to do that, where does it come from, is it innate, uh, is it learned, how could we be better in the world? How could we approach other human beings better? Um, whereas this time around, I felt very much the specificity of the location and like what Lacey was kind of trying to portray about the South. So I think it works on both levels. It's also kind of more widely about America. Uh, Pew is pretty silent, doesn't communicate much at all, and this really unnerves everyone. And there's a lot of people sort of gravitate towards Pew, try and find things out about them, um, tell Pew stories, you know, just this need to talk and use a lot of words. So in many ways it felt like it was making a comment sort of on um, America and the talking cure and therapy in that sense as well. But yes, a huge theme here is faith and religion. Um, you know, what does it mean to have faith, be religious? How does the institution of the church hold up against the things that it's actually supposed to believe in? And Lacey uses The Ones Who Walk Away From Amelas, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it, um, by Ursula Le Guin. It's a short story as an epigraph to this book. And I think they're very closely related, which is something we kind of concluded together in our book club. Um, I personally believe that that story is the um, overall, was the overall inspiration for this book, the seed from which the rest of the book germinated. So if you are going to read this book, I highly recommend you read that story. I think it's very illuminating and it helps um, make sense of the book a little more. But yes, that story is about people who walk away from this utopia and the utopia relies upon you know, one destitute child, one scapegoat. So the reason it can be a utopia is because one person suffers a lot. The story is obviously about the ones who walk away from Omelas. So I think Lacey is trying to say something about the people that walk away from 
places like the South, um, small towns and insular mindsets. And I don't think, as I said before, um, there are redemptive characters in here. It's not all one note. I think that speaks to Lacey's kind of familiarity with the area as well. Um, so I will let you explore this one for yourselves if you haven't read it yet, but it really is a masterpiece. I mean, I couldn't fault it, to be honest, for what it sets out to do. I think it does so perfectly. And like I say, there's so many layers of interpretation in here. It, it works on so many levels. There was discussion in our book club about, you know, who is Pew? Um, obviously the town thinks they're a traumatized person who won't speak and won't kind of talk about their past. Um, but is Pew something more? Is Pew something more than human? Um, that is something you'll have to make your own mind up about, but I highly, highly recommend this one. It really is a fantastic book. Um, but yeah, you're not going to get answers here. It is a kind of a weird, uncanny, strange book. Um, and it is, again, easy to kind of gloss over it, sort of read it and think, I don't know what's going on there and I don't care. Um, but I think if you get into the nitty gritty of it a little bit more, it's a really rewarding read, so highly recommend that one. Um, but let's work through now the rest of the books that I read in January and February, kind of going from best to worst. <laughs> Not exactly, but you know, more or less. So we're starting with The Scar by China Mieville. This is the follow up to Perdido Street Station, which I read in 2021, I want to say, and I really, really enjoyed it. Mieville is kind of classed as a new weird author. There's elements of sci-fi in here, there's elements of fantasy in here. So this book um, is focused on a woman called Bellis Coldwine. Uh, she is fleeing from her home city, her beloved home city, New Crobazon, um, which is where Perdido Street Station is set. And she plans to take a ship to a faraway colon colony, lay low for a bit, and then maybe return in the future. But her journey is commandeered by forces far beyond her control. Um, I didn't know what to expect with this book really at all. I didn't read much about it. Um, I only knew that it, there would be pirates. And I very much enjoyed reading the twist and turns, the revelations, the things that happen throughout. So I will leave the rest to your imagination. But this is a fun fantasy book about pirates. I mean, I can't remember the last time I read a pirate book. Mieville is just brings together everything I love about speculative fiction here. Um, his world is just relentlessly imaginative and really like not derivative of anything that's come before to be honest he makes up something that feels really unique really new which i love of course i read a lot of speculative fiction and a lot of it does have a very similar feel especially in fantasy specifically he also always brings the big ideas the big themes the interesting underlying ideologies with his work and the concepts expressed in here work as a perfect foil to Perdido Street Station and in fact the whole book does to be honest. So if you weren't so sure about Perdido Street Station, um, the language is quite verbose, quite sort of over the top, quite kind of pulpy almost and I know that some people also find the plot a little bit drawn out. I personally loved both of those aspects of Perdido Street Station, I think they work totally within what Mieville's trying to do, but this one feels more direct on both counts. Um, again, I did see some reviews the other day which said that this one also was a little slow and it does have kind of deviating moments, but I think overall it just really adds to the atmosphere of the book. I find his books very well paced personally, but I think this one is probably slightly more focused and faster paced than Perdido Street Station. The characters in this were incredible. Some people will not like Bellis. If you don't like sort of unlikable, abrasive protagonists, you're probably not going to like this one because Bellis is a little bit like that. The imagination it takes to write something like this, I'm just in awe. I'm very sad that he hasn't written more from the Baslag world. I want to know everything about every region and every character I come across. I just love it. Um, there's only one, I think I've only got one book and one story left. Um, so I'm very sad about that. But yeah, for me, for such a chunky book, I mean, look at that. Um, I just wanted to keep picking it up. It felt like a page turner to me. I did a buddy read for this one and I know that I'm not alone in that feeling. Just 
so enjoyable, you know, but also clever, um, which is just the dream combination. And also just the writing so atmospheric. The prose is very considered and really there's no other author I can think of that will paint the picture of where they've imagined better than me, Ava. Overall, I was super, super impressed with this one. I highly recommend. I think you could read this one without reading Perdido Street Station first as well. I mean, it follows a very, very minor character from the first book, um, and I don't think you really need to know what happened in the first book. It is obviously alluded to, but it's not a necessity if you'd rather go straight to this one if you're in the mood for pirates, I don't know. So my second great fantasy find of the last couple of months was Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. Robin Hobb has a lot of fans in our Discord server, so I have been really intrigued and wanted to read something of hers for quite some time. When I was putting together my 2023 TBR, I thought I gotta stick in some Robin Hobb. So we've got Assassin's Apprentice here. So her major work that people love and adore and cherish um, is a big epic series called The Realm of the Elderlings or Realm of the Elderlings and it is comprised of a number of trilogies so you can read this trilogy or another trilogy I think it's called the live ship traders interchangeably first you can read whichever one you like first but she wrote this trilogy first so I thought I would just go chronologically literally how she wrote them so we're starting with this one this is the the first book in the Farseer trilogy. So if you want to join in with me on my Robin Hobb journey, please do. So this is a first person narration. Um, it follows Fitz, Fitz, Fitz Chivalry Farseer, bit of a mouthful that, um, who is a bastard of the royal household. He's taken into the royal household and trained to be an assassin. Um, and obviously his mere presence causes ripples, political ripples, so he's dealing with the fallout of that as well as he grows up and comes of age. It definitely feels like this is on more familiar ground than Mievel's novel, you know, it's not quite so outlandish in what it imagines, but I really loved Hobbes more kind of quiet psychological take on fantasy here I mean compared to some of the other big names that were writing I think this is from the 90s this first novel um, so compared to her contemporaries writing novels similar to this one um, she definitely has a focus on the individual on the human sort of elements rather than the big epic elements which I appreciate love so much it reminds me a little bit of Le Guin Le Guin is is different they're different authors but that kind of warmth that comes through I know that Robin Hobb did a lot of writing whilst raising her young children and I don't know I just feel like it comes through like that love of other human beings I don't know how to describe it but just a real sense of um, what life is like I don't know compared to um, some of the other fantasy authors out there some of the men um, we're gonna get to the way of kings in a little while <laughs> so yes anyway it feels on more familiar ground um, but there are some lovely imaginative details in here which speak to a love of the natural world um, and just really appeal to me and my kind of how I see the world and view the world I feel like her magic system suited me it was well paced it was interesting I liked following Fitz's story and upon finishing this one I immediately ordered the other two even though I've got so many books on my 2023 TBR I would love to at least finish this trilogy this year um, I know that it's a bit of a thing in our group like how quickly should you consume Robin Hobb's no novels um, and I do sort of feel like I do want to drag it out a little bit because sometimes you're just really in the mood for a fantasy like this which is transportive and readable and there's lovable characters and it's really hard to actually as I say for me to find something like that so I feel like I want to drag out the process a little bit but I do think I'll finish the Farseer trilogy this year. Let's talk a little bit about the Deptford trilogy by Robertson Davies. I finished Fifth Business in December and then the second two books were my first 
reads of the year, the first books I finished this year. So I really had to cast my mind back for these ones um, because as, as you can see, I've read quite a lot since and my mind is murky from that period of time. Um, and this is why I need to be doing these <laughs> monthly again. These novels are feel very familiar in their style, but at the same time, have a quite a unique outlook as well so it's going to take me a little while I think to really capture the essence of them so prepare yourselves uh, they're all quite distinct as well they are slightly different we shall take them one by one but in general they're about a set of characters from a small town in Ontario. I think the first thing to note is that Robertson Davies was very good friends with John Irving um, and the beginning of Fifth Business went on to inspire the beginning of A Prayer for Owen Meany and I do think if you like John Irving you'll probably like this although they are different as well. I feel like this is a little bit more experimental. It's leaning more into magical realism but not quite. There are definitely differences to the two authors. When I read those opening pages all I could think about was a prayer for Owen Meany. So it opens with Dunstable Ramsey. I'm just going to call him Ramsey because his name does change from Dunstable to Dunstan in the course of the book. Um, he dodges a snowball thrown by his friend Boy Staunton and it hits a pregnant woman instead who then goes into premature labour. Her name is, is Mrs. Dempster. So this small event or small moment um, ends up being the catalyst to all the events in the novel and that will, as I say, feel very familiar to those of you who are familiar with A Prayer for Owen Meany. Davies has a really confident prose style, it has a real sense of realism, of psychological realism and it's very accomplished in that sense. So in the first novel it's narrated by Ramsey, he's telling the story of his life, basically the majority of his life. He goes to war, he comes home, he becomes a teacher of history, he's coming to terms with his Presbyterian Scottish upbringing. He continues a friendship with Boy Staunton. He has a lasting interest in Paul Dempster and Mrs. Dempster. Um, Paul Dempster being the child that is born prematurely as a result of his ducking the snowball. And it is through him that we get the first sense of a major theme in this book, or the major theme, which is, I'm just going to directly quote, the mythical elements that seem to underlie our apparently ordinary lives. So Ramsey has a fascination with saints, um, he is a hagiologist, and um, not necessarily in a religious sense, but more in the sense of the miracles and impact one individual can have that feels mystical and mythical. And so, as I said, we never quite tip over into magical realism here. Instead, Davies is trying to show us the magic of everyday life. Um, so I was expecting it to be more magical realism but it's a little bit more subtle than that and very effective and that's what makes this book quite unique I think that individuals are something more than just their sort of human mammalian selves so then we get to the second book which is the manticore when I read that this was going to be one man's journey through Jungian psychoanalytic therapy I was like Oh no, because I do not get along with psychoanalysis. I don't like that body of theory. I think it's distracting. I understand it has like an important impact in some areas and things, but um, it can be distracting in the study of literature. But anyway, I am able to admit that Jung is a little better than Freud. But anyway, I was very, very pleasantly surprised by the manticore. So the person undergoing therapy is David Staunton, Boy Staunton's son. And he's telling his life story to his analyst, obviously. So we get a lot of background. We get um, Ramsey from a different perspective. We get to fill in some of the blanks anyway from um, the first book. And yeah, the thing that saves it for me is this idea of the mysticism of everyday life and it really comes through especially in the latter half and then the ending i remember being really struck by the ending of this one and really enjoying it so thankfully it was a success with the manticore fifth business is probably i would still say superior it feels like a more complete novel you could probably read it as a standalone whereas the manticore you definitely need to have read fifth business to understand i would say um but yes i was looking forward to world of wonders alas 
this was my least favorite novel in the trilogy and I just think ends it on such a damp note um, which was a real disappointment obviously it follows Paul Dempster turned Magnus Eisengrim um, that's his new name because he becomes a famous magician if you can believe it um, and it's told from the point of view of Ramsey once again this novel there's just some there was something off about this book so Paul tells his story I can't bring myself to call him Magnus Paul tells his story over dinner they in general are working with a filmmaking crew um, making a documentary about another magician and Paul is sort of playing the magician in the documentary and so he's telling his life story after dinner sort of as after dinner conversation we have the videographer we have the director and we have like a producer and so each of these people comments on his story as as does Ramsey and Liesel who's a great character who I haven't mentioned yet but um, and they each kind of have a different take on his story and it just feels very clunky and weird and where um, Davies's writing had been very psychologically real and felt true to life before that. When we get to this book, it just feels suddenly awkward and strange. Um, Paul also is a generally unlikable character. Um, and even though he has the most outlandish life of all the characters, you know, the most unusual, he works in a carnival for a long period of time, he works in the London theatres, he becomes a magician. I mean, this is interesting stuff because it's sort of drawing the curtain back and showing you the mechanics of it and the not mystical magical things about it um it sort of works against the other two books and maybe i mean that must be purposeful but it sort of ruins a little bit of the magic of the other two books also trigger warning for this one because terrible things happen to paul i will put the full i will put the trigger warning in my blog post as well if you want to check that but yeah this one is quite dark at times it can be dark in general over the course of the three books but this one felt darker so what to make of the trilogy as a whole should you read it overall I found it very enjoyable um, it certainly had its flaws but as I say there were some really interesting quotes in here um, and a theme that I don't see very often in other books I don't think you know it was a very accomplished piece of writing um, in the book Ramsey encourages his students to write in the plain style to not get in the way of the story and I definitely think that's Davies's approach to writing a novel um, it feels kind of plain and transparent but it's masterful in a sense because it's difficult to do that well so um, I definitely appreciated that and I'm really looking forward to the other Davies trilogy trilogy that I have on my shelf that I plan to read this year um, which is the Cornish trilogy. Let's talk next about Four Ways to Forgiveness by Ursula Le Guin. This is a collection of four stories about forgiveness and love and they are considered part of the Hainish universe um, but I wouldn't say you have to read her other Hainish books to read this one if you're interested. Obviously I'm trying to finish a lot of Le Guin's work this year so this is part of that project. Um, with this one, by the second story, I was starting to get worried. The first story was great, just classic Le Guin. Two people sort of redeem, two flawed characters redeem one another. The second story um, just felt clunkier and awkward and I just wasn't really very invested in it or in the characters. I didn't like them very much at all. As I got into the third story, as I got into the fourth story, I really began to understand what Le Guin was doing here and ended up just loving this volume as a whole. And you know, I just feel awed by her and her work and her imagination and the way she manages to get into really difficult topics in a very elegant way and succinct way and really demonstrate all sides of an argument in such a way that it isn't playing devil's advocate, but it is really bringing out the nuance, the gray area of like actual real life and doing it all within the high science fiction um, interplanetary world, uh, really capturing real issues in an imaginative way, taking it out of our context and putting it into a different one. So the stories are sort of around the same 
topic and are loosely connected. There are about two planets, um, Yowe and Werrell. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those right, but there are pronunciations at the back of this, I believe. So Yowe was colonized and controlled by Werrell and on both planets, uh, slavery exists, essentially. They call it something different, but it is slavery. And recently, before we get to these stories, Yowe has thrown off the yoke of Werrell and the enslaved people there have managed to rebel and win freedom for their planet. And obviously this is having a ripple effect of its own on the enslaved people that live on Werrell, um, on, you know, how Werrell is dealing with the loss of that planet and those resources. Um, so everyone's in a state of flux on both planets because Yowe is now trying to figure out ways of governing themselves and also dealing with the entrenched misogyny in their culture, in their society. Both planets are sort of in a state of change. And by providing us with multiple different perspectives over the course of the four stories, we get, as I say, such a nuanced view of the devastation that colonialism causes culturally as well as literally, um, the difficulties of, of um, depicting any society in black and white terms and the different knowledges that are valuable in the world, um, that local knowledge is no less valuable than general knowledge um, or scientific knowledge, that there's a real value in local knowledge, that no culture is free from um, criticism and also a real um, admiration comes through for the bravery of revolutionaries and people that want to make change and want to make the world a better place. By being in the grey, um, Le Guin does not give up any moral standpoint, you know, we know where she stands and yeah, she's interested in the intersection between gender and race and slavery, just all around so much complexity going on in here. Written in Le Guin's classic style, which is kind of deceptively simple and readable, but so beautiful. There's something, I don't know if it's the cadence of her sentences or the particular vocab she chooses, Just she, you'll just read a sentence, you'll be like, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever read in my life. She just manages to capture life so beautifully. I just love Le Guin so much and I really look forward to reading the other stuff I've got of hers to read this year. Um, so there will be more Le Guin where that came from. So next we have The Tartar Step by Dino Buzzati. Um, so I talked about it a little bit, but I will briefly say it again. Um, I have been reading a few of these sort of vague dystopia sort of books um, because there was a, f a little bit of comparison going on in the Discord server about um, a few of these books. So it was The Tata Step, um, The Wall by Marlon Haushofer and I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. Um, and whilst those latter two are probably more closely related because they're narrated by a woman and written by women and um, have more in common on that gender front, I can definitely see why you might put this one in this sort of category with those two. And I think all it was really interesting for me to read the three of them back to back and compare across them and see how different authors might approach this sort of strange, unknowable, uncanny uh, literary dystopia. Um, of course this one isn't really a dystopia but we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but I did think, this is why this one's appearing a little bit toward, more towards the top of the video, I did think this was probably the more masterful of the three. I wrote eight pages of notes on this 250 page novel um, because I feel like every sentence counts in this one and every sentence can lead you down a different road of interpretation with it. Um, just for reference, I wrote one page of notes on The Way of Kings, <laughs> which is a thousand pages long. So that kind of gives you an idea of how I feel about those two books. It's about a soldier called Giovanni Drogo. He has just finished his training and he is going to be posted to his first ever post and it turns out to be Fort Bastiani and when he arrives at Fort Bastiani he realizes life there is essentially pointless. There is no enemy, there's never been an enemy, it's a fort in the middle of nowhere looking at nothing or is it looking at nothing and the officers there seem in some kind of weird 
state of stasis and he plans to only stay for a few months but something of the enchantment of the place of the landscape begins to come over him and he finds himself unable to leave and he stays there for decades of his life and it is about his life at the fort. So this is one of those puzzle-like books where it's fun to try and interpret it different ways and see what fits. Is it about how people get themselves into monotonous boring lives? In the introduction to this Tim Parks notes that Buzzati was sort of inspired by his night shift at a local newspaper and how boring it was and so definitely you could interpret this book in that way like how people end up in these monotonous lives and don't do anything to change it. Is it more directly about being a soldier and this idea of glory coming in the future sometime but you don't know when it's coming and these fantasies that these soldiers weave about themselves making more out of what that actually is. Is it about how humans just tend to live in the future um, always waiting for something to happen but never bringing it about themselves and about our um, relationship with the time are the soldiers protecting the world of meaning from the world of nothingness and as a result sort of living in this meaning hinterland um, there's so many great interpretations you could put on this book take away from this book and I think Buzzati leaves it open for you to um, interpret it your way there's no answers here but there's lots of interesting textual bits that can lead you up down different roads the style is dreamy it's detached it's deceptively simple you could just breeze through this book in a day or two and just not really take much from it but again like Pew if you get into some of those interpretations if you begin to try and unpick it a little bit I think it could be a really rewarding read but based on that I don't think this novel will be for everyone you know lots of people will find it a little bit boring a little bit monotonous but if you enjoy that kind of puzzle like book then you might enjoy this one and you don't mind having no definitive answers. Next we have Grief is the Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. Been meaning to read this one since I read Lanny and I do definitely think there's similar structural things um, across the two books. This is a little, it's called a novella but it veers so often into a sort of prose poetry that I'm reluctant to really think of it as a novella um, about a family who's just lost their wife and mother so it's a dad and two sons um, and they are visited by Crow who is described in the blurb as antagonist, trickster, healer, babysitter. Sort of, sort of drawn from mythology this image and figure of the crow comes to represent grief here and is both a friend and a foe to the family, more a friend than a foe but sort of bringing the absurdity and strangeness and uncomfortable uh, aspect of grief um, as well as allowing them to express their grief and express it in however they want to express it. So yeah it's delivered from three different perspectives so we get dad's perspective, the boys which is a collective voice which I loved and Crow's perspective and um, just like tiny little fragments essentially um, like I say it kind of veers into poetry very often just describing their lives following this loss and some of the healing that happens of course it's not complete it's never complete with grief it's lyrical it's strange um, it does capture something of the experience of grief rather than just saying you know this character is grieving it captures something of its essence it's one of those that I think would bear up to a few rereads to really get the most out of it um, especially because it is super short so as with Lanny I found Porter to just be a really talented writer I look forward to reading other things that he writes so on to Eileen by Otessa Moshfe um, this is my first experience with her um, I know she's beloved in many online circles uh, I have sort of been avoiding her a little bit because having read many reviews of her work I felt like she might not be for me and although I was initially quite pleasantly surprised by her I ended up landing pretty much where I thought I would with her work and um, that's not to say there wasn't lots of good elements about this book but I'm not sure her and I are going to be best friends <laughs> um, I do have my year of rest and relaxation on my shelf and do plan to read that this year and then I'll kind of make a conclusion as to whether I will be prioritizing her work in the future but yes let's chat about Eileen so it's unsurprisingly this book is about 
a woman called Eileen. She lives in an unnamed town in New England. It's the dead of winter. She is narrating from some point in the future um, a pivotal moment in her life. She's in a crappy job. She works in a boys prison and obviously that in itself is kind of deeply questionable, the concept of a boys prison. Um, she lives with her alcoholic father. Um, she doesn't have any friends and she feels isolated and alone and she has a lot of self-loathing, you know, towards herself as a woman. She doesn't feel like she's very attractive. She doesn't feel desired or even like, you know, other women want to spend time with her. She's pretty unpleasant as a person. Um, and I think Moshe did a fantastic job of bringing Eileen's distinctive voice to, li to life. This is what I really initially liked about the book. It felt, you know, the prose was very accomplished. I really felt Eileen's voice. Um, it felt cinematic almost. You know, we were invited to see Eileen, see the image of her. Um, I thought the town was written really well. And I think most women would have, uh, would recognise some thoughts of Eileen's in themselves, maybe not to the same extreme. Um, at least I very much hope not. You know, how society makes women feel about themselves. But it did begin to drag um, and it got very repetitive as well. There wasn't much more beyond that. So Eileen unpleasant, but also the way society treats her also unpleasant. We weren't pushing much beyond that. Um, and it took me a lot longer to read it than it should have done. It's not a very long novel. Um, the ending, an ending I kind of liked, but it is maybe a little bit abrupt. But yeah, it's something just fundamentally missing from this book to me. I don't know if it was a little bit more subtlety or, you know, something more interesting to say than women can be unpleasant too. I mean, um, I like that she wants to depict that. I understand she does that across a few of her books, um, but I needed something more from it there wasn't quite enough. And also when you write a book with no light in it, with no kind of lightness, um, I feel like it makes it a little bit one note and therefore you can't feel the darkness as much. Um, so I definitely felt that with this one. I didn't love how um, Moshe presented maybe some of the other victims in the novel. Um, I felt uncomfortable about some of it, particularly towards the end. I'm sure you'll understand if you have read this book. So yeah, I was sort of ambivalent towards it in the end. Um, the prose is very accomplished. You know, she's obviously um, a talented writer, but I, I needed more, something more from it. So we'll see how we get on with my rest, year of rest and relaxation and I will keep you updated. Next is a book I don't have on me because I read it on my Kindle. Um, it was Limber Lost by Robbie Arnott. There were things to like about this book again, but it didn't leave a huge impression on me. I won't be thinking about it for months and years to come. It's about a teenage boy living in rural Tasmania. He's helping his father with the family orchard. It's set, um, s s most of it is set over one summer. He really wants to buy a boat and he's gonna achieve that by, it's sort of, um, it's set around World War II. His brothers are away, so his older brothers are away fighting. And so that adds a little bit of narrative tension, obviously. And it's set over the summer. He wants to buy a boat and he's shooting rabbits um, and selling their pelts to make enough money to buy this boat. So the boat is a focus. There are a couple of other images that are focal points for this book. So it's, you know, a reflective, quiet coming of age tale um, about this boy growing up in this very rural place and it's very beautifully written. And again, the nature writing is very nice in it. But as I move deeper into the novel, it begins to kind of jump around in time a little bit and give you parts of Ned's life. Um, Arnott withholds the name of his wife, but if you have any sense, you'll immediately know who his wife is. So it's kind of an odd choice and I think distances you from um, one of the major female characters in the book. Um, but as I, yeah, I felt as I moved deeper into the book that we lost a little bit of the narrative tension and in turn my interest was waning a bit with it. It's one of those books that just is more kind of reflective 
fragments that converge around a few key images like the boat for instance. It fits to me in this category of contemporary fiction which just feels a bit half-baked. Like I want these authors to work on these books for longer and if there's not enough ideas in the book to sustain it for a bit more substance to really think about that. It didn't feel quite finished to me. Um, I wanted a little bit more. Something was again missing from this one. But I would 100% read more Robbie Arnott. I really liked his style. I don't read a lot of Australian fiction and need to read more. But yeah, like I said, it didn't make a huge impact on me. So moving on, let's talk about these two together. Um, to I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman and The Wall by Marlon Haushofer. So as I said, it's really, if you're interested in either of these two, I do think it's really productive and interesting to read them together because they touch on different things, but they have similarities as well. And it's quite interesting. Um, I Who Have Never Known Men is narrated by a woman who her only memories are of growing up in a cage, essentially with 39 other women. And the cage is patrolled by guards who won't give them any answers and the women are not allowed to touch they're not allowed to raise their voices at one another they're not allowed to withhold food from one another so they're in this very strange situation and essentially it's sort of a thought experiment to say what would a woman be like in this situation would she retain anything um that we would recognize as womanhood um would she be kind of another person altogether i will give you a little spoiler because i think it won't matter too much if you know this but they do escape and it is very kind of they come out into this very strange world um strange desolate world and then this novel is about uh, a woman who goes to visit her cousin's hunting lodge in the Austrian mountains and her cousin and cousin's husband go out into town for the evening and they never come back and the woman discovers that this invisible wall has been thrown up overnight and she sees no activity outside of it. It's like life has come to a standstill and so she is sort of trapped within this wilderness by herself and she must learn to survive and she has a dog and a couple of cats and she luckily finds a cow so she's got some milk she is also alone and the narrator in this one again a little spoiler but I don't think it's going to spoil too much for you ends up being alone so you've got these two women living in these worlds by themselves and living a life of survival basically um, I think this one is the slightly superior book. Um, it's obviously been published as part of the Vintage Earth series. The nature writing in it is just beautiful. It's mostly made up of her looking after her dog, her cats, her cow, just doing the daily realities of survival. Um, and in the afterward to this book, um, Claire Louise Bennett makes the excellent point that this was a way, This writing this book and creating this scenario was a way for Haushofer to imagine a woman living alone in the woods, um, away from children, away from a husband. What would that look like? How would she become something other than a woman or perhaps expand her view of womanhood? or humanity and I think having that comparison so the narrator is first person narration so she having had the life of a wife and mother and then changing to this life I feel like made for a more fruitful discussion of gender rather than this one where the narrator is sort of unable to connect at all with that um, but both have interesting discussion around gender and gender roles. This one, it is a little monotonous. It is about survival. Um, it's not going to appeal to everyone. It is a quiet novel, but not in the way that I typically like quiet novels. I like quiet novels that are also about human connections, whereas this one is about her connections with her cow and her dog and, um, you know, the natural world. But I do think it has interesting things to say. There were lots of kind of quotable passages in here that I enjoyed. Um, and I sort of enjoyed just following the monotony a little bit. It's quite relaxing almost. Um, and it does say on the back of here, the London Review of Books Review said it was by turns utopian and dystopian and idyll and a nightmare, which I think is a kind of um, good way of describing it because it does have, she does feel a certain sense of relief. 
at not having the responsibilities that she had before. Um, with this one, I thought it was it was a good book, but it was not an amazing or great book for me, and I don't think I'll be thinking about it for a long time. I wasn't massively invested in this one. Um, and also, I didn't like, so with this one, she comes across odd things, and you know, you're thinking to yourself, what's happened here? Like, what is this world? Why are these women being kept in these cages? I don't mind not finding out the answer, but there were some like strong inconsistencies even with the like they just didn't the thing that might have happened just didn't match up with other things that might have happened Do you know what i mean it's almost like she didn't start she didn't have a starting point herself she just wanted to create the aftermath rather than even thinking in her own head what might have happened she's just kind of chucking things in um so definitely on that level it didn't work for me with this one the narrator is just wholly uninterested basically in what's happened so beware of that this is speculative fiction but she doesn't really care about the wall the wall as i say this um householder uses the device of the wall to isolate this woman make her live a life in the wilderness a life that most women especially at the time it would have been extremely strange for them to take part in um voluntarily but because it's just the wall essentially that's the only thing that we get it works a little bit better it's cohesive it feels whole and correct um even though she's not really interested in investigating the wall or getting out. So yes, take from that what you will. Thank you very much Varsha and Gina um, from our group for recommending that we read these together and sort of initially drawing to those lines of comparison because I did find it interesting even though I didn't really love either book. Okay, we're into our last couple of books here. Um, let's talk The Way of Kings. <laughs> My written, my first draft at least, I don't know whether I'm going to publish it all, but um, my written review of this is pretty long and ranty and I'm unsure whether I should go into full-blown rant on this one as well because I know so many people love Brandon Sanderson and I do not want to ruin your experience of him or make you feel bad about enjoying his books or, you know, say that you can't like him or whatever. But he is a good example of the things that I sort of don't really enjoy in fantasy. Um, so I'll try and keep it brief, but please <laughs> skip this if you absolutely love The Way of Kings because I don't want to make you, I don't want to make you upset. And do you know what it really taught me that I am a little bit of a snob? I mean, we already knew that, I think, when it comes to books, but I just, doing my degrees has ruined me with books. I can't enjoy things on a guilty pleasure level at all, basically, anymore. I will pick it apart. And there is an enjoyment, I have to say, in picking something apart. I do sort of enjoy getting ranty about this book. So there is that element, that that, that enjoyment level is still there. But um, yeah, I just can't... I just can't, I, I'm ruined essentially by my studying English literature for so long and um, I do need things to, I do require certain things of my books. Um, so it definitely taught me things about myself, things I already knew, but they were really looking at me in the face with this one. So on that level, I just don't think Sanderson is a particularly talented writer. Um, some of his, you know, fantasy ideas are good and I liked them, but still, I think I would say I prefer, obviously, the imagination of Mieville, the imagination of Hob, you know, where they go with their worlds. I prefer this one felt a little bit more like you know, when an author's like, oh, they drink wine. What can I do with wine to make it different? Do you know what I mean? Like I had that feeling. If you're going to change some aspects of the wine drinking process, there has to be a thematic or ideological reason why you're going to change an aspect of the world to me i just don't like arbitrary what feels like arbitrary changes obviously this feels familiar in this way that hobbs um trilogy also feels familiar it feels like sanderson has read tolkien so yeah i don't as i say i just don't think sanderson is particularly talented right so when i read my fantasy i need a the coming together of like a good pro stylist with a focused use of fantasy elements and a real sense of like psychological realism you know a, an ability to write a, a 3d character um and i think sanderson doesn't necessarily possess 
any of those things. What he does instead is just writes a lot. Like he gives the characters backstories, which is great, but do these backstories give dimension to the character it's themselves? No. I didn't feel like there was much consistency in some of the characters' choices. Like some of them just felt totally bizarre. And my other major problem with this was I don't really connect with war. I don't really connect with the sense of honour. There was lots of hand wringing about is it ever honourable to kill another person or commit an act of violence? Um, to me, this is a sort of very black and white basic version of the discussion. You know, I love um, novels that are willing to explore the relationship between violence and power, but this one just, you know, is a bit of glorification of war and just the use of honour without really interrogating masculinity. I don't know. I don't like war books, we know this. I don't know why I didn't think about that before I started. I listened to this one. I liked the narrators well enough. I liked the narration well enough and I did finish it I mean it kept me going until the end just about oh yeah back to the length thing just writing loads of pages about the world is not good world building just wanted to put that out there <laughs> anyway my loves um I was sort of uh in the initial few days after finishing this one I was intrigued about where it would go next it ends on this big cliffhanger and a real kind of tense moment but I have to say, a few weeks on, I'm not particularly interested in returning to Sanders Sanderson's work. I can well believe as well that he's improved on various of these things. Oh, by the way, another thing I really don't like, sorry, I just have to say it because it did make me feel quite uncomfortable, was the um, depiction of slavery and different races in this book. Just like, why include it if you don't know what you're talking about? Yeah, I, I, I'm willing to believe he's improved some of these elements um, since writing this book because obviously I think this is his first novel, if not one of his first novels. Um, but I just, yeah, don't feel the urge really to return. Um, maybe I think if I'm really stuck for an audiobook in the future, but probably just not for me. Do you know, I hated this book so much I'm not even going to go and get it off the shelf to show it to you. I'll just put it on screen. <laughs> I'm feeling that lazy about this. Um, I finally, finally finished The Prisoner and the Fugitive by Marcel Proust, which is the fifth and sixth volume, included in one volume in my copies, um, of in Search of Lost Time. If you've made it to volumes five and six of In Search of Lost Time, you don't need my review. I'm sure you have opinions of your own. Uh, but this one of, I think this is probably the most painful instalment, but I have felt extreme pain in some of the other instalments. If I had known what In Search of Lost Time would entail and how actually, I'm going to go so far as to say not good it is, um, I probably wouldn't have probably wouldn't have embarked on the journey. Um, I think you could probably get away with reading um, The Way by Swans or Swans Way, whatever you want to call it, and calling it a day if you want to get a sense of Proust's work and what he's doing in these books. I don't think you need to go on and read the entire thing. <laughs> a lot of it's not great. Um, I know it's an iconic modernist work, but um, I can't. It's not good. Um, I sort of get it in terms of, um, well we can talk about this more when I finally finish the whole thing to be honest. Um, I do get it in that it, it's been very influential, influential, so I'll give it that much, but, and, and I sort of see where people are coming from with that and um, it's interesting in the sort of history of literature sense. Yeah, we can talk about that more later on. But yeah, The Prisoner and the Fugitive were just painful in the extreme so basically the i'm trying to think of a horrible word to describe the narrator um but i just can't think of anything bad enough the repulsive narrator um has essentially imprisoned a girl in his flat in paris called albertine and it got to the point where if I read the word Albertine again, I was going to have a visceral throwing up reaction. The whole, basically the majority of these two books focuses on his relationship with her um, and how jealous he is all the time and his meditations on love. But it's very clear to me that Proust had absolutely, if this is what he thought romantic love was like, 
or women were like. He had no idea what real love was like, no sense concept of it. But the narrator presents everything as if it's like a universal truth, so that'll get annoying real quick. So much misogyny, so much homophobia, just horrible. <laughs> page upon page upon page. No paragraph breaks of stuff about jealousy. Whenever we left the flat and didn't talk about Albertine and went back into society, I mean, bar some of the, as I say, misogynistic and homophobic things that are constantly said throughout, I enjoyed it a little bit more. Um, I, did, I do quite like the depiction of society, even though it's full of horrible people. Um, and there was one nice section where he's listening to a piece of music, but honestly, a horrible reading experience. I don't recommend it, but I can't turn back now. I need the bragging rights to say I've read In Search of Lost Time. I have gone too far. I was expecting better. It has not happened. I just need to get through the final volume now and then I will be done and you will never have to hear me speak about it again, which I'm sure you're looking forward to as much as I'm, well, not as much, trust me, but almost as much as I am. That is all the books that I read. I read a couple of Shakespeare plays as well, which um, you will have seen me chat about Hamlet and Much Ado About Nothing. Much Ado About Nothing I enjoyed a little more. I love that play. Hamlet I enjoyed a bit less, mostly because you need to get a good Hamlet. There's a lot of Hamlet in that play and I loved reading all the iconic bits but um, you need to have a Hamlet that you can like because there's quite a lot of unlikable things about Hamlet and they can really get into, into the nuances of it and a lot of people don't play Hamlet very well. <laughs> Kenneth Branagh. Um, much to do about nothing. Fantastic. I really like that play. I think it's just fun and I love the banter elements. The gender dynamics are interesting, if not totally perfect, but they're interesting to sort of think about and it's just fun. It's well paced. Enjoyed it. That is everything. Thank you so much for watching today. I will see you again very soon and I hope you go and enjoy some of these books as well. Bye.